I was definitely trapped by the dogma of believing that I only knew how to do it in one industry. So you went from like multi-millionaire in the mansion on the beach to an 800 square foot apartment. Yep, got knocked all the way down. You've got something, go for it, get to work, make it happen. Find your niche, but be specific about your niche. Kent Clothier, what is up, man? This is super exciting. You are a guy that has built a $1.8 billion business before you were 30. So my big thing is, oh, I built a, an eight-figure business before I was 30, <laughs> but that's like, you know, 10 million plus. You built a $1.8 billion business. So that was a grocery supply business, is that correct? Yeah, it was a grocery, basically arbitrage business. We were uh, buying yeah. and selling truckloads of groceries kind of on the gray market. Amazing, and you built that up. I mean, you, you learn how to do leadership, operations, sales. I mean, what was that like all before 30 years old, kind of just jumping into the deep end, man? That's, that is the deep end. You know, you only know what you know, right? So yeah. if, you, if um, at the time it seemed perfectly normal and logical, right? Because I had never had no other life experience up to that point outside of, I'd always worked, you know, in the grocery industry with my father and uh, kind of came up in that industry. And then ultimately, you know, we switched gears and got into this arbitrage play, diverting plays, what it was called back in the day. And, yeah. and um, one thing led to another and that turned into a fairly substantial business pretty quickly. And then we got bought by a much larger competitor. And, you know, before I knew it, like I said, by the time I was 30, we were, I was kind of at the helm of a rather large organization, you know, continuing to help build it, continuing to help drive it. And, and um, I just didn't know what I didn't know. To me, it just seemed like the natural progression. So it wasn't until I got some distance from it, you know, many, many years later that I realized how unique that, of an experience that actually was. Mm. Were you the sole owner or was that, you had some No, 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 no. Partners. I, my, my father and I started the company, then he exited the company when I was 23 or 24. And then yeah. we were bought by a much larger competitor. Um, and then ultimately I, you know, was now running the much larger organization and uh, all of that by the time I was 30. So I know I've seen uh, like you and Ryan Pineda, that's how we met. I saw you speaking at Ryan Pineda. I DM'd you and you're like, yeah, man, I'll do a podcast with you. So Props to you for, for responding and doing this. But it's like, man, you um, had things kind of fall apart a little bit where you kind of lost everything about my age. I'm 31 right now, about to be 32 yeah. in December. Yeah. I, I've heard that on other podcasts that you've kind of lost everything yep. around that time. What, what was that like? What happened? What were you feeling? I mean, dude, it was... Um nothing short of devastating in the moment right yeah. i mean at that at that time i had only known one thing you know as we just touched on i'd built um i dedicated my life at that point into building an organization it's all i knew uh every relationship every friend every everything i had was wrapped up inside of this organization which you know in large part that's probably what is re what was required at the time and that's the reason mm -hmm. why i was as successful as it was um but you know, when I, I got into a run in with my business partners and ultimately walked out of there and started down a um, downward spiral, I had no idea that that was what mm. was going on at the time. And I thought I was going to go off and and restart my business and, and you know, build it all again, uh, just with no longer having partners and people in place. I would basically do it, you know, on my terms moving forward. Mm. And it just didn't work out like that, right? It took me about two years uh, to basically lose every single dollar I'd ever made, uh, basically to burn every relationship all the way to the ground, to go through a divorce. And, you know, it was a, and in all of that, you know, none of that was about, um, you know, any bad personal decisions. It wasn't like I was drinking or doing drugs or anything. It was all just about, I just thought I was smarter than I was. And um, I was not humble or, or in any way, shape or form. I just believed that I could go and wave a magic wand and pay my price and do what I needed to do and be back in business and be back on top in a matter of, uh, you know, a few months, if not a few years. And it just did not work out like that. Basically, right. I, you know, I was, I, I got a very, very big dose of humble pie to figure out that I was nowhere near as smart and as clever as I thought. So I was you went from the, like multimillionaire in the, the mansion on the beach to an yep. 800 square foot apartment. Yep, got knocked all the way down, about as, as low as I would, uh, you know, I would not wish it on any of my uh, of my enemies. I can tell you that that fall was yeah. hard. It was dramatic. Mm -hmm. It was, um, 
you know, put me in a very, very depressive state. I, I would ar easily argue that I was suicidal when I was going through it. And so it was a bad, it was a bad gig. But, you know, looking back, what it definitely taught me was resilience. At the end of the day, yeah. you know, I'm extremely grateful that I got a, a, a second season in life, right? Got remarried, have two beautiful little girls, you know, have a great relationship with my wife, have an amazing business, have, you know, been able to impact millions of people. And none of that would have happened if I hadn't had that fall from grace. Do you think that if you were in that 800 square foot apartment and then going to where you were, where you are today, do you think having that past experience was the catalyst for you accomplishing what you've accomplished? Or do you think if you started out, because there's a lot of people starting out like in, in that zone at 31, they've never had a business. They've, they're in a thousand square foot apartment or whatever, not about your size of your apartment guys, but you know, they're in a low spot with not much behind them. And what should someone like that do? You know, that. Well, look, man, we're all, we're all a product of our own experience, right? Nobody gets, you yeah. Know, we're all product of the way we were brought up, et cetera, everything that happened. You know, I was just brought up in an environment by an entrepreneur father that, you know, good wasn't good, great was expected. And so I was always, um, me and my brother were always expected to, you know, give our best at everything we got, period. And I think when you're raised in that kind of environment, and, and I mean, in a militant way, I don't mm. mean in a superlative, you know, kind of talking about it. I mean, actually driving it down into us every single day. Yeah. It definitely helps to shape you. Right. And so yeah. that way I was raised, the, the way I was, the environment that I was put into where, where I was never, I was never once was I ever told that I needed to go to college. Right. I was always told, you know, if you've got something, go for it, get to work, make it happen. Mm. Right. So I started many businesses when I was in my teens. Right. Um, and so that very entrepreneurial environment certainly put me in a, in a situation to where, like I said, by the time I'm 30, I had my PhD in, in how to An build and scale a large yeah. organization. Right. Yeah. And so you don't forget that. And so, yeah, you know, look, when I'm, when I was getting beat down, um, I was definitely trapped by the dogma of believing that I only knew how to do it in one industry, one thing, mm. right. All my relationships, all my experience was in one thing. And that was very, very scary for me. Cause I never knew if I'd be able to get back on top, right? I didn't know one thing about real estate. Um, but once I got a little momentum to your point uh, and got going in real estate and realized that, Hey man, because when I started, it was very simple. I don't want to be broke anymore. I don't want to feel sorry for myself anymore. I've got to go and create income. I've got to figure out how to, you know, just stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. It was that simple. Right. And I think that's, you know, we all start there. Like I got to be able to figure out how to get on my feet and, once I figured out how to get, get on my feet and once there was some consistency to it, um, you know, moving from consistency to intentionality is a completely different thing, right? So now, hey, I'm, I'm comfortable that I can, I can make a living. Well, now what happens if I do things on purpose? What happens if I actually try to scale this thing? What happens if I put systems and people and processes and leverage in place and really try to take this thing to the next level? And clearly that, all that thinking mm -hmm. was because I had done it before. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, to your point, I don't know that I would have necessarily thought those thoughts at that particular time if I'd not had that previous experience. But, yeah. you know, that that's the key. It's about the reps. When you, when you want to move from hustler to CEO, you know, that's what happens, right? You have to you have to start. You have to ask those what if questions. What if I get out of the way and I was able to, you know, start creating leverage points in this business? How much bigger could it be? How much more freedom can I create? How much more time can I spend with my kids? How much more money can I make? How much more wealth can I create? All those what if questions are the driving force. What What do you think? Like, is there a certain point that an entrepreneur should go from the hustler to actually being the CEO? Is there are there like steps in your mind or your so basically process? Basically, the the first step is that when you are when all your bills are paid. In other words, I can consistently pay my bills, and I can consistently sock some money away. I can consistently live the you know a reasonable life, right? Something I'm, I'm that most would settle for that I'm comfortable with. I'm there. Right. And at that, at that point, then the natural step is that now you've got to start thinking about, okay, now I've got, now I want to scale this. If you don't scale to CEO, you scale to manager, meaning I've got to start putting people in place and mm -hmm. I got to start putting systems in place. And I'm not, you know, I'm not really running a business yet. I'm, I'm, I'm on the first step to running a business. I'm putting things in place that allow me to, to create more revenue, more profitability, but on the efforts of others. But I'm, but I, my, my new job, for lack of a better way to say, is that I'm managing people now. 
rather than me actually managing the revenue and driving the revenue, I'm managing people that drive that revenue and drive operations. And then once the next step is now you get managers in place of you, and now you're the CEO, right? Now I'm sitting on top of it. My managers are managing their teams to get me to, my time is now spent looking on the horizon, three, five, 10 years down the road. You know, how, how do we vertically integrate? How do we extend the lifetime mm -hmm. value of the customer? How do we add, you know, more opportunity into this business. That's yeah. where the, it's kind of where the CEO lives, right? Yeah. And then, you know, the step from that is as you add these new verticals, new opportunities, new businesses, if you will, um, you start putting CEOs and organizations in place of each one of those to now you're the chairman of the board sitting atop three or four different CEOs. And then ultimately, you know, the, the you know, Shangri-La, if you will, is you get to a place where you're ultimately the investor. Right. And in other yep. words, I don't need to play any active role. I don't need to be mm -hmm. the chairman of the board. I'm going to be the guy that's writing the checks, making the money, creating significant wealth um, because of the organizations and the people I put around me. And, you know, that's that's where everybody's trying to get ultimately be real smart. Right. And so but it's a to your point, there's a progress. There's a step. The very first step is you have to step into the role of manager and you got to get real comfortable putting people in place to do things that. Your, your your natural instinct is going to be, why would I put somebody else in place mm -hmm. if I can do it, <laughs> right? I'd be saving money. You know, it's like when you go and rehab a house, you see these people that, well, why would I pay somebody $2,000 to paint the house? You know, mm -hmm. I, can, I can go do that on Saturday or Sunday, right? That's the hustler mentality. Mm -hmm. um, you're not saving money, you're giving up time. And time is the only thing we any of us it's really everything. have, yeah. right? Yeah. And so why would I, if I could pay somebody, you know, if you, if people were really, really honest with themselves and, you know, I, you may have heard me say this before, but, but, you know, if somebody told you, you had 168 hours left on this planet, seven days, those 168 hours, each one of them, you, you would quickly realize that just how valuable they really are. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, but if they're valuable in that moment, then they're equally valuable in every moment. And so you're when you have the opportunity to buy back one of those hours for anything less than priceless, mm -hmm. you're saving money. So if I can go spend money, invest money to get somebody else to do a task and it allows me the opportunity to either spend time with my family, friends, do it, or equally go help and grow my business, that's, that, that shift has to take place to move from hustler to CEO. Yeah. Without that shift, it never happens. Yeah, so you flipped thousands of homes like what eight thousand homes or something like that what's the, what's the number Our organization point? yes my family's yeah. organization i've definitely flipped in, in excess of about ten thousand homes so like what what do systems mean to you like for me and my i my audience here is construction business owners so i talk a lot about systems and i say hey let's build even just a squarespace website you know and put every single process every receipt form every button for templates everything's just built into that that process, that template for you and your real estate company. Do you have like, you know, is it Google docs? Is it this? Like what's when, when people talk systems, I like to kind of take it an, a step deeper and be like, how, like I mean, when? we have a system for everything, right? Yeah. So we use Salesforce in some of my businesses. Okay. We use go high level in other businesses. We yeah. use click up in other businesses. Um, we use a lot of Google docs to your point, the systems, I think you have to go back and think about it in a different way. Systems do not necessarily mean automation, right? I mean, yeah, people had systems long before there was ever a computer, mm -hmm. right? Ford built millions of cars long before a computer or the internet right. ever took place, right? And so systems are simply a process, uh, an yeah. efficient process to deliver a predictable result, mm -hmm. right? And so... You know, whether it's a checklist, whether it is, is uh, you know, again, a simple defined process that mm -hmm. you can measure results out of and create a predictable outcome over and over and over. So, for instance, you know, you brought up, you know, our, our company does anywhere from 800 to 1,000 rehabs a year, right? Mm. All single um, family stuff, right? All single family. And, you know, we have a process for everything. Um, the way we order materials, the way we do our walkthroughs, the way we, you know, uh, distribute uh, payment. The way, there is a process 
for every single thing so that we create a consistent, predictable So outcome. is there just like a Google Doc somewhere that says like, yo, when you're about to order materials, like use this checklist or whatever? Yeah, basically every one of our houses, uh, we have a supply list that is 85% of the rehabs we do. We The materials are going to be, you know, the same. There is nuance with the other 15 to 20%, but, yeah, you know, most, if you think about it, most rehab people that go and flip or flip houses, mm-hmm. um, everything is a one-off. And so in other words, in this house, I'm going to do, you know, marble countertops and um, the pools on the, on the cabinets are going to be this. I, everything is a one-off scenario, right? So literally what that means is a individual has to make a decision and create a log jam for, of information mm-hmm. that is highly dependent upon one individual, Bottom a collection line. of individuals to make decisions, right? Mm-hmm. Now, in our world, how we flip so many houses is that 85% of those decisions have already been made. Here are the materials. Here's exactly the skew. Here's exactly where you go get it. Here mm-hmm. is the price we want to pay per square foot. Here is the day that it will be delivered. On the, you know, here's the day we want it. Everything is defined. So, and the, you know, we've minimized the nuance. So what's the 15% is that, hey, this this area, this neighborhood can get this type of upgrade on granite to quartz or could like, be any yeah yeah could be anything yeah. like that like hey this area we may you know this particular house has hardwood floors in it and so rather than rip up the floors we're going to do you know we're going to stick with the hardwood floors and so there's you know you come across different things like that um or you know this has every but if you minimize the nuance that means 80 percent of the the decisions that need to be made in that process mm-hmm. have already been made and everybody's working from the same playbook and then once it becomes quite regimented, then your your team becomes wildly confident mm. and becomes empowered. And they're not running to you. They're yeah. not running to you for the, every little decision and every little situation because they understand exactly what the outcome is that you're looking for and they exactly what the decision has been made consistently for the last 35 times that, dis, that problem has come up. This has been, so they're now confident to make the decision. Yeah. Detail in systems has saved me countless amounts of time where I can go be with my wife and do this to that travel because I know that my COO is running my company. You know, I I own an eight figure construct commercial construction business. I've dabbled with flipping homes, but I'm done with that now because currently losing some money on my last few, but long story short, we're doing medical imaging centers. We're doing indoor batting cage facilities. We're doing jobs for BMW, Pepsi, you know, wrapping up all kinds of really cool million dollar art gallery renovation, all kinds of stuff. Oh, nice. Coffee shop. We're turning an old blockbuster into a new coffee shop franchise. Lots of stuff. That's, that's an eighth of it. But man, it all comes down to detail in the system, setting clear expectations. So I don't know if you, if you owned a construction company, cause you know, that's who my audience is. How would you, how would you run it? I mean, you know, you kind of do have a construction company, right? I mean, do you subcontract, yeah. You know, to general contractors or subcontractors to... So we have, you know, we basically are running, we have general contractors and subs that are working on all of our jobs. Internally, uh, we have project managers, right? So our team, project managers, they are working, I'll call it six to 12 rehabs at any given time. So Mm -hmm. one project manager is responsible for six to 12 jobs. The GCs are out there actually doing the job and they have a very specific reporting cadence on outcome. And so then our project managers are reporting to, you know, our COO or, or the head of head of uh, construction and rehab inside of our organization. Yeah. Right? Do, do you so, ever do like multifamily? Not in that organization. We do in one of our in one of our in, inside of our funds. So mm. we have a, a business that actually runs real estate funds. And over there, yes, we have. OK, that. we do a lot of multifamily, too. We just wrapped up turning a 116 unit hotel into apartments here in Jacksonville, Florida nice. and uh, all kinds of other two and three hundred unit complexes. So yeah, J Lane Construction. We should we should link up. <laughs> if yeah, you ever do anything sure. in, in Florida, I don't know. So how much is your wife and your family involved in your business? Do you kind of separate it, or does your wife's name is Seema? Correct? Does she I've always, worked, always worked with my yeah. family since day one? So like I said, my father and I were in business together, and then um, you know when I when I kind of moved on, my two brothers are deeply involved uh, inside of our REI Nation, which is our our uh, rehabbing and turnkey business based out of Memphis and Dallas that's doing all the houses. Uh, my son works inside of that organization um, hmm. and as well. And so inside of uh, one of our other organizations uh, here at uh, the boardroom, 
Uh, my wife is involved. Absolutely. She kind of works directly with all of our members. And mm-hmm. so it's a tricky thing working with family. And I know a lot of people kind of struggle with that, but um, it's always been a part of what we do. Um, I think the key to it, you know, as I've coached a lot of people over the years through this, is that it's, you have to, there's a clear separation between personal and business. And what I mean by that is that, I'll give you an example. So when I walk, when we walk in this door here, um, you know, we are no longer married. And what I mean by that is that I'm the CEO of this company. I am running this organization. It is my responsibility. I have, you know, a lot of employees. I have a lot of people that count on me, thousands of people that count on me. And so I'm equipped, perfectly equipped to make the decisions to drive these businesses, right? Yeah. And then she is a, a component of that on the day-to-day basis, but she has roles and responsibilities that she is designed to do. But we are not business partners, you know, in any way, shape or form, front facing at all. Right. I mean, there's an, uh, and then the moment we leave here, now we're back to husband and wife. And that's the same thing inside of all our organizations. Like when we're, when we are, you know, inside of there, my father, my brothers and I, you know, and we all have the same last name and we all have roles and responsibilities, but we are, you know, there's one dude that's running that company over there. And that is my father. And um, I, I'm not running the investment side of that business. I run the companies I run. He runs the companies mm-hmm. he runs. That's the way it is. So and, question for you, why do you decide to, to run multiple companies? Um, most of the organizations that we run are born out of necessity. And that's the way I would tell most people to scale businesses. And so when you're thinking about scaling a business, if you have a business right now and it's working um, and you're looking to scale, you really can only scale a business three ways, in my opinion. One, you either do more transactions. Two, you do bigger transactions. Or three, you figure out how to extract more value out of your current transactions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in real estate, it's a great example. You know, what, how do you do that? Well, you do that through effectively bolting on other businesses and services. So, you know, if you're in the real, in the easiest way to do it, just think about it like this, who owns the transaction after your transaction? Okay. So if I was in the new home construction business, for instance, you know, there's a appraiser involved. There is a, an inspection involved in those, you know, prior to selling, there's a mortgage involved. There's a real estate, there's a realtor involved. There's a title company involved. There's a move in company involved. There's a staging company involved And every one of those businesses that are a very natural, um, next step. I'm looking to try to own it, right? I want to try to own as much of the outcome as humanly possible. And then, and again, you look at any great business, you know, you mentioned Blockbuster earlier. I don't know if I would call it a great business anymore. But back in the day, when you went to go rent a movie at mm-hmm. Blockbuster, well, waiting for you at the counter was all of the candy and all the stuff to take home, you know, so that when you're watching the movie, the popcorn and all that kind of thing, what's the, they know the next thing you're going to do when you walk out of there is you're probably going to go buy all that stuff. So why don't I just own that, right? And the same exact thing, Starbucks, you walk in there, you buy a coffee, well, for years, they were just coffee. Well, now, you know, before you know it, now it's, oh, we know that most of our customers are naturally buying food or they're, you know, if we can get them to sit in here longer, they'll use our internet and they'll buy more. Like you have to think about who owns the next transaction. So are you like really a big component of vertical integration, right? Like, so if things can kind of grow together, I had dinner with Grant Cardone. I signed up for one of his like contractor, you know, events and his coordinator, text me and they're like, Hey, we're, we're just reaching out to like two or three different like contractors and they wanted to come have dinner with Grant. So I'm sitting there in Miami. I just bought a new Porsche. We rolled up with my wife and we go to this back, you know, event and, uh, you know, Brandon Dawson sitting there and Buck his his marketing guy, Grant. And they're just like, long story short, I'm asking him all kinds of questions about undercover billionaires and stuff like that, but keep the main thing, the main thing. That is the main thing that I remembered Grant saying to me. Cause I was talking about J lane construction. I was talking about J lane properties. I was talking about doing my YouTube thing, doing my NFT thing, doing my, this, there's like so many other things in life. He's like, J lane construction is the main thing that's going to get you to your mm-hmm. ultimate end goal. And so what I've learned, I've seen it kind of like I'm boiling a pot of soup, right? I got the perfect, I'm really good at all these ingredients, get everything set up, turn the burner on. I'm like, okay. So I was kind of getting a little bit 
almost bored a little bit because it's like, okay, it's like the same thing. I'm, we're doing great. We're getting all these clients and we're doing tens of millions. But then what if I what if I flip some houses? What, what if I went over here and built co- courses or coaching or masterminds or like those things that you do? And I want to talk about that in a second, your advice, your opinion. But, you know, it's like, man, things were getting a little bit messy. I come back over to the J-Lane construction soup and it's kind of boiling over a little bit. So I'm like, whoa, guys, let's tweak this. You know, I have an amazing team and an amazing COO, but you know, we're all learning. So I'm curious, man, like, you know, I'm focused on J lane construction right now. You know, um, why do you, why do you coach? Why do you have the mastermind? What is it? Is it a dollars thing? Do you just, well, well, first off the mastermind is the main thing. The mastermind is the main thing. Okay. Right. And so the mastermind, uh, puts, you know, we've had that for 11 years. It puts me in direct contact with the, the very best real estate investors in the country, right? Mm. And I am their leader. And being the thought leader and the authority in a room like that is extremely powerful, yeah. right? And a byproduct of that is because of all of my experience and because of how much I've helped the, you know, been around this industry for, for so long, um, there are people in there that naturally would like the opportunity to work with me privately. Right. And so now that kind of lends itself to putting uh, the reason I do private CEO coaching is really twofold. Right. Almost everybody in there is already a natural part of my mastermind. And again, who owns the next transaction? If you're going to go somewhere and get private executive coaching, then I would argue, why would you not just go to the best? Right. Hmm. So just come to me and we'll Hmm. work with it. And we have that entire thing is built out equally. That puts me in a situation to where it allows me the opportunity from a deal flow perspective and from a private equity perspective to potentially work with very qualified people and actually helping them grow their business. And so effectively, I'm getting a behind the scenes tour of somebody's business, helping them grow that business. And ultimately, there were, there might be an opportunity that I choose to come at them and invest in their business, help capitalize their business, put resources to work and really grow that business, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you think about it in that standpoint, um, having really good operators and partners getting paid effectively to do all that due diligence along the way is a, you know, is a really smart way to go about doing that, right? Getting paid as a consultant. Um, And so that's why that exists. Now, equally, if you think about my, my mastermind, you know, we have our Anybody wants to invest passively in real estate, well, that's what our REI Nation company does, right? So if you want to put capital to work, that's what there. Our funds are sitting over there because it, we're investing in multifamily and ground up development and hospitality mm. and self storage. And like, if you want to again put money to work, we have that there. If you, the businesses that I own all kind of serve that that uh, mastermind, right? So we own a very large recruiting firm, helping people to build out their teams. We own a very large training company, helping to train their team. We own a very large uh, accounting firm to basically get all their books cleaned up so that they can become bankable, so that they can actually have a balance sheet that'll work and so they can actually go build wealth off of this business that they're Mm. running. And it goes on and on and on and on and on is that when you think about what are the things that your customer are naturally going to do without you um, and where are they naturally going to go, Is there, can you acquire a company or a partner or can you provide the service that keeps them in a place where quality control is in place and where you can help them achieve their goals while also adding ancillary profit streams to your business? So that's a very smart thing to do. I like it, man. So you're the CEO of the Boardroom Mastermind. Mm -hmm. Do you have other CEOs for the accounting firm? Yes. Yeah. Every one of them. So Everyone. you, so every other one, but the mastermind. Correct. Yeah. Right. Because you're the right. mastermind. <laughs> right. Because, well, but at the end of the day, that is one that I'm still, I play a very active role in it as the CEO. All yeah. the others, um, you know, we have what are, what are called our portfolio companies. There is a CEO that sits over the top of all our portfolio companies and the yeah. other CEOs report to him and all of them ultimately report up to me. Do you set up like profit sharing for those guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Every one of them are, you know, either in profit sharing or they're literally on the cap table. They, they own equity in the company. Yeah. Very nice. I love that. So, I mean, you don't have to say, I know it's maybe private, but like how much is your mastermind? <laughs> uh, our mastermind, you know, first off is you have to be qualified to get in it. Right. Yeah. We literally have about a 4% annual 
acceptance rate. So about 96% of the people that come to us, we, we they're just not qualified to be in there just yet. And, it, and it, we try yeah. to help them, but the reality of it is, is this is elite. Wow. Um, yeah. And if they are elite and they are the right fit, then they can come in for 30 grand if they pay it all in full, 36,000 if they finance it, or they can come, and then we have a, a tier up, which is called our billionaire boardroom status which gives them these, these are like the biggest players in the industry, right? And there's about 75 of them inside of our mastermind. And they, those guys come in at 50 grand a year or 60 grand if they pay it in installments. Got it. Nice. So what's one advice we can kind of close it out for a construction business owner. I mean, you've been 36 years in business, right? I mean, you've seen the real estate side, you've seen a little bit of the construction side. You got lots of grocery experience too, but business experience, massive, big business experience. If someone wants to take their construction business from 2 million to 20 million, and then maybe eventually 200 million, but although those might be two different conversations, what would you tell them? I mean, the key is to go, look, I, I'm a huge fan of simple is better, right? A lot of people fall into a very specific business type. Um, and whether they realize it or not, or whether they admit it or not, they find themselves in a situation where they're more obligated um, to keep down going down a path they're going because it, you know they defined it that way at some you know time mm -hmm. in their past, mm -hmm. rather than take steps back. And this is you know this is the benefit of working with with somebody who is a, a CEO coach or executive coach because they have no emotional uh, relationship with your business, right? And somebody take a step back and say, man, if I had all your resources and I was doing everything you're doing, mm -hmm. um, what's the best place where it would fit? Like if, if you had no obligation to do it the way you're doing right now, where's the best place, right? And so like you mentioned earlier, construction in, in single family, you know, if you had the opportunity and you had the expertise and you had the resources and you had the relationships to go and do it on, on the commercial side, mm -hmm. um, where the customers are, uh, much more likely to repeat buying from you. So in other words, if you were working like with a developer um, who, who only works on triple net leases and he owns relationships with some of the biggest franchises and all he wants to do is he wants to go and build uh, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts mm -hmm. or, you know, Wells Fargo branches or whatever the case may be. And you owned, he owned the relationship with the franchise, mm -hmm. you own the relationship with him. That's the only place you'd want to be. Right. Because you basically have to take care of, of one customer and maybe you had two or three like that. But uh, putting your business in a place to where and, you know, having taken the time to step back and say. Who has the biggest appetite for my services? With the least amount of red tape, with the most amount of capital. So who has the dr biggest desire, appetite for it, lots of capital, can move quickly, pays their bills on time, et cetera. That's where you want to go, right? Keep it simple. You don't want to go, you know, inevitably um, in new construction, like custom home builders, et cetera. They, mm -hmm. they, they position their resources into a place where they've backed themselves into where you're dealing with a very customer facing client that has baked into the equation a bunch of nuanced nonsense that is mm -hmm. just friction points in the yeah. business mm -hmm. where if those same resources were applied in a commercial setting and to your point whether you are doing conversions right yeah converting a kmart into into self-storage or mm -hmm. converting you know big box store into multifamily, whatever right like mm -hmm. who has the appetite and who has the money and who has the drive and desire to do it and they want to do a lot of it that is the place and that is the customer where you go dedicate your resources so find your niche Find your niche, and but but be specific about your niche. In other words, yeah. who can you know? Forget about your you know. Building is building. Mm -hmm. We all know that building at the local level, building you know around the country. There are there's again nuances to everything. You know, some areas of the country you want basements. Some other countries, other areas of the country you have to take into floodplains. You know, I get it, right? All that I get it all. But my point being is that building is building. If you had to do it all over again. You know, and and you're sitting there building single family homes and you're dealing with all the nonsense. If if the if you could only sit down and you had a minute, you know, meeting with Howard Schultz at Starbucks and he said, I want to build 500 stores next year in the, in these 10 states and I want you to do it and we will pay you on time every time. It's going to be pretty cookie cutter. There'll be a little bit here and there, but uh, what? 
you would change your business. You're exactly right, man. Because we just signed like a million bucks worth of contracts this morning, because um, I think like 700 grand of it was Planet 13. They're a medical marijuana facility out of Vegas. And uh, where are you located, by the way? San Diego. San Diego. Okay, because I know Ryan Pineda is in Vegas, and we met there. But anyway, but um, we just signed another contract with them. We're going. We're building. 26 stores in Florida over the next three years. This is my point, right? And that's my point is that people get trapped into what they, but if they actually took a little step back and said, man, we know how to do construction. We know how to hire contractors. Mm -hmm. We know how to do X, Y, like 80% mm -hmm. of that is applicable. Generally speaking in the building industry, whether it's commercial residential, or like, again, I know yeah. there's nuance, but yeah. You know, most of this is managing people, managing timelines, managing budgets. That's what it is. How do you manage your people, like, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, we we have a very specific cadence. We we yeah. are products of the EOS system. I mean, we absolutely use it. We absolutely subscribe to it. I think it's the best thing anybody could possibly do that is a business owner. Nice. If you don't do that, I think you're a fool. Yeah. Um, because you're guessing at best. And so we have very specific dashboards that we work with. We know we have our fingers on the pulse of every business. We have a very specific meeting cadence. We do not get bogged down in nonsense. We know exactly the, the rocks we are trying to move inside of our business and how we're going mm -hmm. to achieve our goals. And everything yeah. else is noise. Right. And Do you use predictive you, index? No, we use a company called Team Architects um, that uh, uses a, a, a like service like that. But every hire we make, they, we send them through a, a predictive index like process mm -hmm. except it measures even further uh down into their cognitive skills so we understand you know in anybody that doesn't grade at a 90 percentile or better they'll never even get an interview with us are there specific right. traits you're looking for for specific roles you absolutely have, they kind of absolutely. document it because yeah. this yeah, trait might be good for a, this you trait. Know, we have an avatar for everybody yeah. right and inside of team architects we we have adjusted and weighted what we know the best uh, traits are that we're looking for. And so salespeople have to have very specific traits. Ops are almost 180 degrees opposite, right? So we know what they have to be able to do and what they can't do. And so one, making sure they have the skills to do it. Two, making sure they want to do it. And, and three, making sure that they are you know, the kind of person that fits into our culture are all huge, huge parts of, of getting the right team in place to where all this thing starts working. So I want to ask you, um, I know we don't have unlimited time here, but if I wanted to start a mastermind, should I do it later in life <laughs> when I'm, you know, had this business, you know, being built for, I'm, I'm going to hit 10 years in business in March. Mm -hmm. Should I wait till 15, 20, 25 years? I mean, you're, I mean, you no know, masterminds are all about is it's much less. The power of the mastermind is not you or I, right? The power of the mastermind are the people that you put in the room. Yeah. It's not a coaching program. So you don't forget that. Right. right. So if you have right. authority and you have an audience and you're respected, than being the catalyst that brings together the other thought leaders. That's what a mastermind is. Mm -hmm. You are not the mastermind. Right. And so I don't think your age or your, you know, if you are respected in this industry and yeah. you are already a thought leader, then being mm -hmm. the catalyst that brings together other thought leaders is extremely powerful. And the point of a mastermind is to, you know, share the collective wisdom of others, right? Putting them in a situation to where, they are pouring into each other and solving each other's problems. And there yeah. is an art to all of that. And it's right? funny because they're pouring into each other, but they all pay you. That's right. <laughs> right. And so I'm, I'm the guy that put it all together. I'm the guy running the show. Our team, you know, of a dozen people are working night and day to make sure that mastermind is extremely powerful at every way. The connections, the information being shared, the systems, the processes, everything is, you know, it's an, but you have a team of people that share on stage, like, yo, like, here's the info, whatever. No, I mean, we will, at our mastermind, our structure is very simple, right? So we'll bring in, you know, our group of 200 will get together four times a year. And then, uh, and everybody in that room is, 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 again, the best at what they do, right? We are savages when it comes to well, who gets in the mastermind. And so for two hours in the first, the first day, we all kind of, uh, work on some stuff together as a big group, and then they break out into actual hot seat rooms. So eight different rooms, 25 people in every room. And over the course of those two days, each one of those people in that room are going to get the opportunity to stand in front of that group and break down their business. Mm. And by break down their business, I'm talking about pull back the layers and say, this is what I need help with. And the other 24 people in that room are all going to pour into them. Here's how you solve that problem, right? We've been there. We've done that. Solve it like this. 
And so that takes place over the two days. In between all that, mm -hmm. you know, everybody gets back together. That's a big group for lunches and dinners and a few more meetings. But the most powerful thing at a mastermind is giving people the opportunity, not standing up and putting speakers in front of them. That is not a mastermind, right? A right. real mastermind is that hot seat element. In yeah. other words, where help. I am going to stand in front of the group and yeah. I'm going to be vulnerable and right. I'm going to ask for help. Yeah. So in between the quarterly events, is there like a Slack channel or a Facebook group or like what's in between the... there's there's a, a Zoom call every week uh, to get on there. And there's that basically, hey, some member is kind of showing you what their business is. Every two weeks, there's a Zoom call that where people can all get on there. The members get on there and check in on each other, and ask for help. There's a very active Slack channel, very active Facebook group um, about to we have a resource center where all the recordings of every presentation that's ever been done and um, hot seat or otherwise it's all in there for them to go and look at it in you know a library of thousands of presentations nice. so you're not on these zoom calls every single week obviously right I mean, you no, have a team my, you have my, a staff yeah, my team does all that exactly. yeah but you're at the quarterly events and that's you got it your involvement it's a machine yeah and that's nice. the reason why our members are with us you know four years or longer i mean and you're pulling in six eight nine, I don't know, million dollars a year on this thing or whatever it is. But that's not a bad, you might have good margins too, because I mean, look, the construction margins are really slim. I mean, it's like, if I make 8%, I'm crushing it with, you know, after all my overhead. So, and I, I subcontract everything out. So my cost of goods sold is really high. So then I have my overhead and then that's your net profit. But yeah, maybe your coaching business, your ma I should say, sorry, your mastermind, Maybe the margins are a little better, you know, yeah, <laughs> but you still have a staff. Any business, if any business that's, that's worth going in business is worth doing right. And so you're for sure your margins should reflect all of your hard work for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, cool, man. I don't know if you have any final thoughts. Uh, obviously they can find you. What's your Instagram handle? Kent Clothier. At Kent Clothier. You got it. You got to follow me, man. So maybe if we do a little, uh, you know, I'm at Jesse Lane, we do a little, collaboration post appreciate it we could absolutely my, my, my editor will you know maybe like next three or four weeks we'll we'll talk that is your cell phone i texted yep cool so we could stay in touch this has been such a pleasure is there anything last final words that you want to tell any contractors out there and anyone on the internet any any human being that w no, wants man, to be just, entrepreneurial just, uh, you know the time is now as it says behind me you know that's my thing and just uh yeah you know nobody's getting any younger this is the youngest you're ever going to be for the rest of your life so you know get get very deliberate and intentional with what you want life to look like and go for it. Guys, this guy literally almost had a plane crash and died. I heard the story at Ryan Pineda's conference. Time, the concept of time being so important was drilled into Kent's head. So I encourage all of you guys to make the most of your time while you're here on earth. And I appreciate you watching. Like and subscribe. Go follow Kent on his YouTube channel, Kent Clothier. And we'll see you next week. Peace. See you, brother. Thanks for having me.